In May 2008, an 18-year-old man vanished whilst walking in forest near his home in Woodland Park, Colorado. His disappearance remained a mystery for seven years until his body was finally found. However, the discovery only raised more questions, this time about how he died. Was it as the coroner concluded an accident or was his demise something far more sinister? This is what happens when fact proves stranger than fiction. This is the mysterious death of Joshua Maddox. Welcome back to my channel, thank you for joining me. Today's case is one that I had to cover because when I read about it, I was so confused and I'm still confused. And if I feel confused by this, I cannot imagine how the family feel about the loss that they've endured and the lack of closure around it. And so I wanted to do this case because I want to highlight it. I want to bring it back into public consciousness because I genuinely think that when a case goes unsolved, or as far as I am concerned, in spite of what the coroner has decided in this case, it still in my mind remains unsolved. It can sometimes trigger other people to think a little bit more deeply about this if it personally affected them. And who knows, the more that we talk about these cases that are unsolved, in the end they become solved. As I said, it's not that there hasn't been a level of closure as far as the authorities are concerned regarding this particular case, but where I'm concerned, Joshua Maddox's death is something that remains incredibly suspicious. If you're new to this channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. Crime and consistency is my catchphrase. So if you are new and you love crime content, deep dives, then this is definitely the channel for you. Why don't you get your notifications on, subscribe to my channel, and of course, thanks to everybody who comes back here regularly. You are legends. Let's go back to May 2008. We've got 18 year old Joshua Vernon Maddox, he's better known as Josh, and he at the time is living in Woodland Park, Teller County, Colorado Springs. This is a town surrounded by the one million acre pike national forest, which just sounds absolutely idyllic. I'm aware it's probably relatively dangerous at times as well, but the idea of being surrounded by that level of nature is relatively intoxicating for somebody like myself. Now, Josh's parents, they'd actually separated and he was living with his father, Mike, and his two sisters, Ruth and Kate, at the time. And I would say, when you look at what had been happening to the family, they'd had a really difficult few years. So his older brother in 2006, that was Zachary, he'd taken his own life. I am somebody who many of you will know because you come to my channel regularly and I don't hide my own experiences. I lost my father to suicide and therefore I really have a connection with traumatic grief and loss. And it is blindsiding for every family member. It changes the direction of your life, the paradigm of your experience, and it ultimately transitions your life that you used to know into a life that feels highly abnormal and then takes a very long time, potentially a lifetime, to get used to your new normal. So without a doubt, I can fully relate to the psychological trauma and the powerful change in the family unit because his brother died by suicide. And Joshua had understandably been totally impacted by this. He'd been really close to his brother. He thought very highly of him. And according to his father, it pushed him over the edge at the time. And I often talk about the fact that we underestimate the impact of traumatic grief. We underestimate the actual impact of loss, full stop. Any of you out there who've lost somebody that you loved, it makes you question your own mortality. But certainly in my experience, where somebody dies by suicide that is close to you, you think about taking your own life. So it makes perfect sense that his father's saying, look, this pushed him right to the edge because certainly with my father's death, it pushed me right to the edge. And 
it was a really difficult battle to want to even be here. Now, in spite of this, with those few years that he'd been mourning and grieving and trying to work through his grief, he did seem to have got through the worst of it. Apparently, he was happy with his life. He could see the light, so to speak, at the end of the tunnel. I guess he'd got used to the pain and was learning to cope with the agony. And life was moving forward positively. His family described him as a really bright, talented musician and writer, and he was. He was really popular. He was very well liked by his peers and he was doing really well in school. And one of the things that is noted about him is that he had a really kind spirit. He believed that you should never ever say anything bad about other people. And I think that somebody with that kind of pure soul is quite rare. You just think about social media today and how many people are really comfortable at saying the most horrible things to people they don't even know. But to actually have that mindset and philosophy that don't ever speak badly of other people, that says something profoundly positive about this young man. Also had a real sense of humour, he's a real joker. So he'd once dressed in a robe and snuck into the school's choir during a performance. Obviously, he wasn't part of the choir being the joke. And I just love the fact that he did that. I don't know about you. Some of us may have been the odd joker at school, done things like climbed into cupboards and played the recorder during Latin lessons, for example. I do remember Miss Lunt leaving me in there, if I'm completely honest. I did like her though. But you can see, mischief also ran through his veins and most of us can relate really positively to individuals like that. They find the humour. So we get to the 8th of May 2008. Now that day, it was a typical day. Josh said to his sister Kate that he wanted to go for a walk in the forest. Totally typical behaviour, it's not unusual for Josh at all. He was a massive nature lover and obviously as we know from where he lived, he was in the perfect place to experience nature and connect with it. He absolutely loved to go walking amongst the trees. And for those of you who are into nature, you're probably aware of the massive amount of research regarding how grounding can really affect us positively. So that means going around nature, hugging trees, taking your shoes off, walking in the soil and grass. It's actually really positive. It affects our nervous system in a really positive way. So people who go out and spend time in nature really, really benefit from that experience, the energy shift, and also the de-stressing that occurs just through the connection with things like trees and grass and the sky and nature. But his family, even though they're used to this very typical behaviour of him going out for walks, they start to get concerned because he doesn't actually come home at night. And that is really atypical behaviour for him. Now, they do try to reassure themselves. Josh is quite a free spirit by nature. So they just try to reassure themselves that actually he's probably just gone to a friend's. So then they start to ring around because they're hoping that they're going to be able to connect with him but he wasn't with any of his friends and actually none of the friends that they spoke to even knew where he was they hadn't seen him so in the day that followed the family and friends then start realizing that there could be a big problem the place around them is vast and there's so much land to search and they need volunteers and indeed friends and volunteers come together they search the local area but there's literally no sign of him they say that it was like he'd just vanished into thin air. His family then reported him missing on the 13th of May 2008. That's actually five days after he had left home. And for some of you, you may think, well, five days is a long time. But they weren't panicking or they were trying not to panic because they felt that because of his free nature, because of his free spirited belief system, that there was a chance that he was just experiencing some time alone. He'd had a tough few years. He was really expressive with his poetry writing and his guitar playing, and it could just be that he wanted some time to himself. His dad actually recalled this. He said, I got up one morning and Josh was there. Then he just never came home. The next day, he still didn't come home. I called all his friends. Nobody's seen him. Nobody knows where he is. I didn't know what to do, so I called the police. Now, a search by the Woodland Park Police and more volunteers again fails to find any trace of Josh. And I mean any trace whatsoever. So ultimately, 
They've got no new leads. They've not been able to discover where he's gone. No one's really got any information that could enlighten them as to Josh's movements. It means that the case goes cold. Now his disappearance, it wasn't actually recorded as a runaway because at the end of the day, there was literally no explanation for him leaving. So that didn't necessarily make sense. Josh had only been two months past his 18th birthday at the time of his disappearance. Now that's a problem because obviously he's not necessarily going to be classed as a runaway anyway because he's old enough to do what he wants. At 18, you're an adult, free to do what you wished. So therefore, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, police conclude that there's absolutely no reason to suspect any crime. Therefore, he ends up being listed as missing. That must be really confusing for the family because there were no indications or signs that he was just going to up and leave. But at the same time, there doesn't seem to be any evidence at that moment in time of foul play. And so you always cling on to hope. But as the years pass, Josh's family begin to fear the worst. However, there was always just that slither of hope, and you'd need to cling on to it, wouldn't you, that Josh had just decided to run away, decided to start a new life somewhere. He'd had such a traumatic few years, there was a potential that he was thinking about just reinventing himself. It's not unheard of that people have gone through serious trauma and loss or they feel that the life that they're living isn't a life that they feel they connect with any longer and they just go and reinvent themselves and live a completely new existence. It's not like Josh to not be in contact with his family, but again, he had at certain points told family members that one day he planned to go on this big adventure and that during that big adventure he might not be able to talk with them for a while, which for any of you out there like myself who've traveled, that's very normal. I mean, I went traveling for three years on a shoestring by myself with a backpack and I rarely called home because at the end of the day I was busy doing other things, I was busy living and you can understand that they're clinging on to that hope that maybe he's living a life that he potentially dreamed of and yeah there's a selfishness and egocentricity to not contacting your family because it holds them in a state of limbo and purgatory but they wanted to think the best of the potential and positives that could have afforded Josh as opposed to the terror that they must have felt within their soul that something terrible might have happened to him. Because he was such a free spirit and he was really musically orientated, he was a literary talent, that's what his teachers said about him, they actually thought maybe he'd just gone away and joined a band, maybe he'd gone on tour, or even just elected to live a more isolated lifestyle. Solitude, experience of just writing in the woods, maybe even publishing successful novels under a pseudonym. People felt like it was better to place their hope in those ideas than the contrary, the idea that maybe something bad had happened. Now, they did always recognise that there was a potential that Josh had actually taken his own life because he had been dealing with that horrific trauma of losing his brother by suicide and the fact that it was unlikely he would have been able to fully come to terms with the tragic loss of his brother because it was such a short amount of time that had passed. And clearly, as I said earlier, it's not unusual to want to take your own life when you've been through this kind of tragedy. But he had been doing better and he had been finding hope again and he had been enjoying nature again. So these are all things that led to his family to feel that that didn't really fit with their idea of what he would have done action-wise. And I know we can never always be sure. People that we love take their own lives and we had no idea it was gonna happen. But often on reflection, people can see the breadcrumb trail that led to that moment. But where Josh is concerned, that wasn't that evident. Now his family never lost hope. They just prayed one day that he'd turn up out of the blue. They hoped that he might have a wife and a family you can imagine the forgiving nature of his family members, that they're just investing and hoping and praying that wherever he is, life is good, life is positive. And in the end, they would be able to welcome him back into theirs with open arms. His dad, he never moved house. He always wanted Josh to know that if he came home, he would still have the place that represented his security. 
and also his dad knew this would be the place that he'd come back it would be the only place he'd know to go if he needed support help return but he never did come home then on the august the 7th 2015 this is more than seven years after josh had disappeared imagine having to manage that psychologically you love this person this individual is so powerfully connected to you and you're just praying day in, day out that one day they're going to walk through that door, that one day you're going to get a phone call, that one day someone's going to spot them, that one day that absence will be rectified and we'll be back in the arms of the family. But it's not going to happen because on that particular day, after Josh has been missing for this seven years, construction workers are tearing down this historic homestead. It's on Thunderhead Ranch, which is a wooden cabin. It's about 50 feet from the road, and it's on this large plot of land in Woodland Park. It's surrounded by pine trees. It had actually, just a bit of trivia, been owned by Swedish immigrant Big Bert Bergström. So he was known as the Big Swede. It's around 100 years earlier. Now, Big Bert... Oh, he'd been a major player in Teller County's illegal gambling scene. That was back in the 1930s and 1940s. And at this point, Woodland Park was a hot spot for gambling, for dancing and for illegal drinking. So it was a place where people would go, I suppose, to let off steam at a time where you weren't allowed to do those things. Now, the Thunderhead Homestead, it was pretty much one of the most popular gambling houses. There were several, but it was one of the most popular. It'd actually been an infamous location. It's seen loads of wild parties in the day. And there were actual rumours that it doubled as a brothel. A little bit of a den of inequity, I think. But at the end of the day, seriously, a place that would have been frequented, I believe, very, very often in that area. And people would have come from all around. And Big Bert was notorious. And he eventually was so notorious that the FBI arrested him after investigating him. However, he was such a colourful and popular figure and personality in the community that he'd later been acquitted by a jury of his peers. I'm actually telling you that as a fact. They basically got him into a court of law, put people who liked him in there as the jury. And then they were like, ah, Big Bert, nah totally innocent like I think we've got all this evidence saying that he's not innocent at all because we've got the den of iniquity and all these people saying that they've been drinking and dancing there and you know having sex with sex workers and none of that's actually legal he's just a very colorful personality let him off now oh, okay you're the jury by the way Bert we'll see you in 25 minutes yeah get the drinks ready and also some of the ladies available please just throwing it out there I think it's hilarious and yet obviously inappropriate that the justice system were <laughs> that way back then. But this history of this cabin, this area is really interesting in the community and it stood for something of a time gone by with personalities and colourful characters that no longer exist, so to speak. But again, there's just that kind of strange historical connection. Now, by 2015, the cabin and the actual land that it was on was now owned by a builder called Chuck Murphy. So his parents had bought it in the 1950s, and more recently, it was Chuck's brother who'd actually lived there. And after that, it had been a rental property, then it had been a storage facility, but it had actually been empty for more than a decade. And as I'm sure many of you will know, there is a theory in psychology which is called the broken window effect. So you can have a building that's empty and no one will go near it and it will be left in a good state. But the minute that somebody smashes the window, that will start the absolute destruction of that particular place because it means that people feel that they have an option to vandalize an option to enter and so on and so forth and very much we're talking about a similar experience here it had fallen into disrepair and so chuck had got to a point where he decided that he wanted to clear the site and he was going to build 32 family homes there so whilst it had been empty chuck had gone back he would checked it not often but he'd gone back time to time and he recalled that on occasion he did actually notice a bad smell inside but he just presumed that it was rodents that had got inside and died also mixed with the general smell of damp deterioration and raccoon poo it's not something you get in my parts raccoon poo but i would imagine it's like most poo and won't smell very good but he just kind of 
believed that that was possibly what was causing this smell of decay and it didn't trigger him to do any more investigation. Why would it? But that day in August 2015, Chuck and the contractors, they're in the process of clearing and dismantling the cabin. And there's this large piece of furniture, which is actually a breakfast bar, and it had been torn from the kitchen and it had been pushed in front of the fireplace. So, a bit unusual. We wouldn't expect that a breakfast bar would actually be physically moved from the kitchen, literally torn out, and then pushed in front of the fireplace. But nonetheless, they're just getting on with it. So, workmen push it away. They then start to dismantle the chimney area. And it's at this point that they make a truly grim discovery. So as a digger peels back a steel fireplace insert, which is within the actual chimney itself, it exposed, lodged part way up in the chimney and crammed into the brickwork, a mummified body. You can imagine the shock in that moment that they're just clearing things out, ready for renovation and they move this particular object and start to deal with the deconstruction of the chimney and suddenly in front of them is this mummified body. They call the police straight away and they then go ahead and remove the brickwork. They expose the remains that have been found and they observe at this point that the body in this mummified state is in the fetal position but with the knees above the head. So it's a strange position to find a body anyway. And when they do a subsequent examination of the actual body itself, it reveals that the legs had been dislodged from the torso. Now, I am no medic, and certainly I haven't got a medical degree, but instantly that feels like quite a violent injury that the legs were actually dislodged from the torso. And on top of this, the body itself is naked, well, apart from this very thin, thermal shirt and they also noticed that the clothes that clearly belonged to the person they found they were actually neatly folded in a pile next to the fireplace inside the cabin so just keep that in mind so we have this body mummified just in a thin thermal shirt inside the actual chimney and then the clothes belonging to the mummified corpse are actually neatly folded inside the cabin Bear in mind that I've told you already, there was a breakfast bar pushed up, blocking exit from the actual chimney cavity itself. Just to keep that in mind as I go through this, because I want you guys to be thinking about what you think has happened and whether you feel as disturbed by this as I do. Now, obviously, we've got a mummified corpse, and that means that it has decomposed a great deal. So when they do the identification, they actually have to do that via dental records. And it's at this point that Josh's family get the news that they were absolutely dreading, the news that they never hoped that they would hear in a lifetime. And that is that the remains were confirmed to be his. They were absolutely stunned by the discovery. They couldn't believe that Josh had always been so close to home all these years. I mean, when you think about the original police search, it had covered the surrounding area, but no one had thought to search the old cabin. So he had lain there all these years. And rather than actually providing any form of closure, which you would want for Josh's family, the latest development, wow, it just raised further questions. The whole situation just doesn't make sense. And Josh's sister Kate, obviously reeling from the news, she posted an online tribute to her brother and it said, Sometimes in our life, our stories don't have happy endings. I'm sorry to say that this is one of those stories. Since Josh was 18, it had been reasonable to assume he might have decided to leave town, start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I've always chosen to believe that this was the case. This is certainly not the outcome that the Maddox family and my brother Josh's many friends and loved ones were hoping for. We are, however, eternally grateful for the opportunity to finally provide Josh with the proper memorial service he deserves and to finally lay Josh to rest. I am relieved that we finally are able to give him a proper, proper burial and um, because that's what he deserves. His other sister, Ruth, stated this. He was my best friend. He always made me strive for greatness. 
Josh would tell me that one should never say anything bad about anyone else, ever. And I tried to be more like him. Josh was one of the nicest people I've ever met. And I am very proud to be his sister. Oh, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? Any of you who have siblings like I, who you absolutely adore, you feel a level of protection for them, no matter whether they're older or younger than you. And dealing with the reality of his passing in such a terrifying way, it must be very difficult to bear, particularly knowing that he was so close and yet was so beyond reach. Now, seven years after his disappearance, this means that the mystery, at least, of the whereabouts of Josh has at least been solved. He'd been found less than a mile from his home. I mean, it must be impossible for the family to digest this news. But we have a really big mystery. And that mystery is, well, how the hell did he die? This doesn't make any sense. Now, initially, the police, I would say, obviously suspect that he might have been a victim of foul play. People don't randomly end up in the chimneys of abandoned cabins. That isn't something that happens on a regular. But apparently, and I'm going to say apparently in inverted commas, the actual examination of the remains doesn't support that it's a homicide. Basically, there's no evidence of blunt trauma, so they didn't find any skull fractures, they didn't find broken bones. Also, they couldn't find anything like a gunshot wound, so they said they hadn't been murdered by that. And also, they didn't find any damage to any bones that could have been caused by a knife injury. They didn't even find any damage to the external mummified tissue. So, at this point, basically the autopsy and coroner is saying, you know what, I can't see any evidence for foul play. They also tested Josh's remains for evidence of drugs, and the coroner said, the hard tissue showed no signs of trauma. There were no broken bones, no knife marks. There were no bullet holes. There are so far no answers to a number of things. It's very confusing. So yeah, they've counted out drugs, alcohol, etc., that could have caused death. And they've not got any, what I would say, obvious signs of foul play. Because I get it. If you're a coroner, you know, you're going to be looking at the pathologist report and you're going to want some hard evidence and things like bones being chipped by knives or gunshot wounds being present. I mean, that's easy, isn't it? We can absolutely state there that foul play had occurred. It's a little bit more difficult when you can't find obvious signs of trauma. But I'm going to say this now before I move on. Obvious signs of trauma don't mean that trauma didn't exist. Just because you can't find the obvious ones doesn't mean that something bad didn't happen to Josh, in my opinion. So the county coroner, they conclude that Josh's death had been an accident. Sorry, my intonation was maybe a little bit expressive there. You'll know where I'm going with this, guys. An accident. So apparently, this is how they suggested it happened. He'd voluntarily attempted to gain entry into the cabin. Okay, I can go with that, you know. We've all been there, we've all been young people and wanted to go and have an adventure and find ourselves in situations that are not ideal. Maybe we have ended up in a cupboard and should have realised that our friends would think it was funny to lock us in there for a period of time. We are inquisitive, we are curious, it's what kids do. But whilst I can go with the fact that he could have tried to get into the cabin, the way that they're saying he did it was that he basically climbed on the roof and tried to shimmy down the chimney said no typical teenager ever. Like, I think we can all agree that getting into an abandoned house is pretty much fun. But I'm thinking about the kind of registration mind-wise where we'd think, oh, I know how we're going to do that. I'm going to just climb down a chimney. I mean, this was an 18-year-old guy. He's not stupid. He's a bright kid, really bright kid. He's going to know that going down a chimney is going to be dangerous, without a doubt. You don't know what's down there. You don't know whether you can get stuck. I really struggle with this theory, but let's just go through it anyway. So he'd basically gone down the chimney, shimmying himself down, aka a little bit like Father Christmas, just on a different day. But at this point, he's got stuck and then tragically perished. Now, one of the theories for this is because there's meant to have been a wood burning insert in the chimney which means that someone climbing in from above wouldn't have been able to actually crawl back up to exit. And because there was this large breakfast bar that I've talked about, which was pushed up in front of the fireplace, that meant he wouldn't have actually been able to 
get out that way either. Also, the problem that we've got is that he's surrounded by nature. It was an off-road location. The cabin's position meant that it was really unlikely that anybody would have heard Josh if he'd been calling for help. Although again, they did search that area relatively extensively. So if he was shouting, I would have thought at least in the early days, there was a slight possibility that he could get found. But the family are having to hear this information and they're having to do with this idea that Josh, therefore, according to what the coroner is saying, died this slow, horrible death, possibly through hypothermia or dehydration, alone in this dark, confined, suffocating space. You know, it's the stuff of absolute nightmares. And I mean that. I'm not underestimating that saying when I say it, because it is. It's the stuff of absolute nightmares it's being buried alive essentially but even though this is put forward i don't know you're probably a little bit like me when you're unsurprised that loads of people are skeptical with the coroner's finding of accidental death at the end of the day i just want us to think about what we know so far you know we've got this guy in the fetal position but upside down you know if somebody shimmered down the actual chimney why would they be the opposite way up that doesn't make sense to me per se. That's enough to make me really concerned about the findings. But essentially, this is what he's getting across as the coroner is saying that the unusual position of Josh's body was consistent with him attempting to gain entry and then becoming stuck in the brickwork. But like I said, how do you end up upside down in a fetal position? You'd have to enter the chimney head first. Who's going to do that? Listen, I'm all for, let's put it into the context of Josh is this free spirit who's a massive adventurer and he decides that he wants to gain access to this chimney and then subsequently into the actual abandoned cabin itself. He's not going to go down head first because you could get seriously injured. And also, if you go down head first, you've not got the wiggle room to manoeuvre yourself into a position where you can get back out. So you would be sealing your fate in many ways by doing it. You know, it's not a sensible thing to do in any way, shape and form, especially when the body has been found wearing just a thermal shirt. Remember? His clothes are neatly folded up on the interior. Hmm. He's trying to get access down a chimney to this apparently abandoned cabin, but his clothes are inside. Sorry? <laughs> I mean, this is just bizarre. So how did he get access? How did he actually get in there? How did he take his clothes off and then decide to go through and actually come down the chimney, even though he knows that there's that breakfast bar in front of it? You see, I'm confused at this moment in time. Can you imagine how the family would be feeling? Now, on top of this, Chuck Murphy, he claims, as the person who's the owner of this place, that it's absolutely impossible that that would have happened. He said that the actual chimney had been built on the property 20 years earlier and he had personally fitted, personally fitted, this heavy steel mesh which was across the chimney and it was one row of bricks from the top and it basically hung on hooks. It was all about stopping animals getting stuck down there, he didn't want debris going down there. So he said that Josh literally could not have entered the chimney from above. He couldn't have done it. Now, what was argued in the investigation was, OK, well, we didn't see any evidence of the mesh. We didn't find it present when Josh's body had been found. It wasn't in any of the investigation photos. Although I don't know about you, I think we've covered quite a lot of cases on this channel where the investigation photos aren't always the best, are they? You know, some of these photographers, I think, get carried away doing something else, like just standing and looking outside of a window for hours instead of doing the job. Just throwing it out there. We have covered cases like that in this. So that doesn't mean that much, I don't feel. But what it turns out to be the biggest theory of is that the metal on the property had actually been stripped for scrap during the demolition process. And that's why it wasn't present. But Chuck said, listen, it might not have been present then, but it was certainly present seven years previously when Josh disappeared. He said, there is no way that guy crawled inside that chimney with that steel webbing didn't come down the chimney. Now, in response to Chuck's assertions, the coroner, who's obviously going, I'm right, and nobody else is going to be able to give me a viewpoint that I agree with because I'm right. We all know how these people are. 
I've been at a coroner's inquest. It's the most infuriating experience ever. Seriously, she is very lucky that I didn't throw my shoe at her. Actually, my sister all but did throw shoes at her. My sister kind of had to be restrained at the end of it because she was literally going to attack the lawyer and the coroner. It, that's how frustrating it is. I'm not lying. That's how frustrating it is because you get this supercilious, arrogant individual who's meant to be there to actually think about how somebody has died unlawfully and whether there are other blameful issues relating to the death. And they sit there and act as if they know more than everybody else. You know, they know nothing about the situation. Often they haven't taken the time. They don't even understand the law in lots of ways. And yet they will stick to it and be like, I know everything. And that's really frustrating because Chuck is saying, listen, you've got it wrong. But of course the coroner says, no, I haven't. It'll have just rusted away. And this is how it got into the chimney. Even if that was true, let's just give the coroner our belief that they've got it right. Ask them this. Why would they be doing it naked? Why would they be doing it naked? Why, as a man, with your dangly bits, would you be going down an area with rusted metal? Just think about it. You're just going to have the sense and sensibility to not act in that way. Also, there was the issue with the large breakfast bar. You know, who took it from the wall? Who blocked the fireplace with it? And why? Why would they block the fireplace with it? What would be the reasoning? Well, there's a body in there. So you're going to think if you want to hide a body, then you're going to find somewhere secure to do it. And this kind of fits that premise, doesn't it? Now, again, the coroner could argue, well, it's coincidence. They are just randomly been placed there and it wasn't about trying to conceal a body. It just happened to be there that when the person moved that and placed it there, unknown to them, there was actually a corpse behind it. I mean, is it just me? Is it just me who just thinks that None of that's logical. We've always got to go for the most obvious logic. And this is not logical. The idea that this person just randomly moves a breakfast bar and it happens to be concealing a corpse behind the fireplace, but they didn't know about it. Or that Josh shimmied down it upside down. This is just really confusing to me. And as I said, one of the most confusing things that additionalizes this and the suspicion that I have about what happened is the issues of Josh's clothes. They were folded neatly by the fireplace. So to me, this accidental death theory, I don't think it fits very neatly with the evidence at all. Because for his clothes to be there, Josh had to have been able to gain entry to the cabin. So why then would he go out practically naked, climb onto the roof and then into the chimney? Also knowing that he'd be trapped because he would have absolutely have seen the large breakfast bar blocking the fireplace when he laid his clothes next to it. So that raises so many more questions. You know, if he was in the cabin, why did he take his clothes off at all? Now, the coroner stated this. This one really taxed our brains. Did it? Did it really tax your brains? When you say it really taxed your brains, is it because it doesn't make sense and you're literally trying to fit jigsaw pieces that don't fit in the jigsaw together and it's not making sense because that jigsaw doesn't belong to the actual picture you're trying to paint? Uh, is actually neurological dysfunction. So that's caused by reduced blood flow to the brain. And that means that you're gonna have an interference with cognitive abilities, it causes confusion, it can cause nausea. So I guess you could say, is it possible that Josh went into the cabin for warmth and then subsequently became hypothermic? I mean, what I'd say is that in May, the temperatures in Woodland, Colorado don't actually normally fall below freezing. However, at the time, apparently, when Josh disappeared, they had dropped to minus six degrees Celsius. So there is a slight argument, I would say, that this act of paradoxical undressing occurred because he was potentially hypothermic and this meant that he left his clothes 
neatly folded on the fireplace. And this is another issue for me because I'm saying about confusion, I'm saying about the fact that there would be this cognitive dysfunction and impairment that would lead to these actions, but he's folded his clothes neatly. Why would he be folding them neatly if he's in this state of confusion? It doesn't make sense to me at all. And obviously if he did do that, if this situation where he felt like his body was overheating when really he was really cold and then he took his clothes off that means his body temperature is going to fall further and that's going to cause this severe confusion but like I said I don't think when you're severely confused you would be taking your clothes off and folding them neatly but taking that theory arguably they're saying that he'd leave the cabin in this confused state then maybe he couldn't get back into the cabin and so at this point he then climbs on the roof attempts to climb down the chimney, gets stuck, and then succumbs to the cold. But this theory really doesn't sit well with me. So how would Josh have become lost less than a mile from his home? He knew the woods. He knew the area well. He was often walking alone. So what possible reason could he possibly have had to have actually sought shelter in an abandoned cabin? His home was really close. Also, Going back and what Chuck Murphy has said, the steel mesh would have stopped Josh from entering the chimney from the roof. So if that's the case, if the coroner's wrong and it wasn't an accidental death, we have to look at alternative possibilities, a possible murderous scenario. Hey, let me tell you, even though the coroner has said there was no obvious signs of trauma to the body, there are so many ways that you can kill a person which would leave no physical evidence seven years later. So asphyxiation, that would be a prime contender. And if you think about, shall we say, sex crimes, often asphyxiation is something that we see play out. Think BTK, etc. Strangling someone is, we see a method used by many killers. And on top of that, if you think about severe bruising, so if you've been seriously assaulted, those bruises would naturally have deteriorated, as would the evidence of any serious sexual assault. So there are lots of things that could play out and you wouldn't actually be able to find it seven years down the line. And whilst it seems that there's no evidence of blood spatter found at the scene, who's to say that Josh was killed at the scene? He could have been killed elsewhere. And his body could have been dumped in the chimney as a way of obscuring the body and hiding the body. Now, Josh was actually quite a slim guy. He was 150 pounds, so that's about 10 and a half stone. But he was six feet tall. So if he hadn't actually chosen to enter the chimney himself, what the police believe is that because of his height, it would have taken at least two people to get his body onto the roof and into the chimney. Now, that means that there is a possibility, therefore, that two people, possibly more, could have actually killed him and then work together to actually dispose of his body and you have to consider that possibility you have to think well potentially josh could have been lured to the cabin to the abandoned place in woodland park there could have been some sexual incident at that point maybe consensual possibly not that's why we would have josh's clothes next to the fireplace then he was killed possibly by multiple individuals, maybe he was strangled, asphyxiated, and that could have actually happened during a sexual assault. And rather than going ahead and disposing of his body in a shallow grave, because let's be honest, in an area of woodland, that means that it could have been dug up by animals, it could have been discovered more easily. The killers instead decided to dispose of it on the grounds of the cabin. And bear in mind, that cabin had been abandoned for years at this point, so they're thinking, no one's gonna come here. And then they take the body and they force it up the chimney, not down. And that would explain the unusual position that Josh's body was found in. In his fetal position, his legs dislocated from the torso. It can't just be me thinking about the level of force there. And if you think about the injury itself, that could have absolutely been the result of a prior serious assault. Now, on top of this, we have the breakfast bar issue. So the killers could easily have literally ripped that large breakfast bar from the kitchen and pushed it in front of the fireplace so that they could conceal the crime. And 
I'm not saying that's the perfect murder. It's not necessarily the perfect murder. Certainly bodies can be discovered, but blocking entry to the place where the body is and a lack of expectation that kind of crime has played out would lead to people who potentially even were searching for Josh, even if they'd gone in the cabin, would they have noticed that? Would they have thought best look up the chimney? So to some degree is an excellent way of concealing a body. Now, during the inquest into Josh's death, the coroner and the police had actually received several leads. So people had come forward and put names into a hat, so to speak. So names of people who claimed to have been involved in Josh's death, for example, people who'd actually suggested that they had been involved in him dying. Now, one of these individuals was a guy called Andrew Richard Newman. Now, allegedly at the time, he was around Josh's age. Like Josh, he was pretty musical. He'd been in a band and he was also known to be quite a free spirit. And after high school, he'd gone on to live a relatively nomadic lifestyle. Now, according to some people who actually knew Josh, Newman started to hang around with him. But Newman was going on a different path to Josh. And he starts to develop, shall we say, a less than pro-social reputation. So he's somebody who's got a history of violent crime. Then he goes on to have prison time. And actually, soon after Josh just vanished into thin air, Newman had apparently travelled to New Mexico. And here, he was actually arrested about the stabbing of a disabled man. Apparently, he was friends with the man's carer. They hang out and take drugs together. And it's claimed that Newman had been staying in that friend's property. So one day, this friend, allegedly gone for a shower, leaves Newman with the disabled man by himself, and then he returns to discover that the disabled man has been stabbed to death, and Newman's just gone. Now, Newman was later apprehended and questioned by police, during which time he allegedly admitted to killing a woman in Taos, New Mexico, and actually putting her body in a barrel. Now, for one reason or another, I don't know why, he didn't end up getting prosecuted for either offence. And this is probably due to the fact that the main witness of the guy who was looking after the disabled man and who witnessed, apparently, the killing, he actually got killed himself not long after in a bar fight. So that removes the one witness. And also, when it came down to him admitting that he'd killed the woman and put a body in a barrel, well, actually, a man was already in prison for that woman's murder. So at this point, the authorities allegedly decided that they wanted to stick with that conviction rather than investigating Newman. I am so jaded now in the legal system that this does not surprise me. Constantly, we look at cases where people are identified as the actual true culprit, but there's somebody already in prison. They're like, oh yeah, we're not going to let that person out. We'll just let this person who's clearly guilty just walk away with the crime without any problem. I'm not saying that's the case here, by the way. I'm just saying that it's concerning to me that this guy has got a violent history and past, and he's admitting that he's killed somebody. He's also been identified as a potential killer in another murder. And yet they don't take this any further as far as the authorities are concerned. Now, some actually claim that they'd notified the authorities about the possible link between Josh's death and Newman, who was actually a drug addict and a suspected murderer. But they say that no one took their concerns seriously. And also, where witnesses are concerned, allegedly they claim that Newman was the last person Josh was seen alive with. And then after Josh disappears, Newman allegedly boasted about putting Josh in a hole. Now, whilst the coroner did briefly reopen the case as far as the inquest is concerned into Josh's death, he, along with the police, well, they basically conclude that there wasn't any evidence of foul play and that it was actually impossible to place Newman at the crime scene seven years previously. So... Despite all these unanswered questions surrounding Josh's death, as far as I can tell, they just decided that they were going to stick with the accident theory, which again, does not bolster my belief in the authorities to some degree. Now in 2019, just out of interest, Newman was actually charged with assaulting three officers whilst in prison for burglary. And according to social media and the reports that are on there, he's currently back to his usual antics. So he's roaming around, he's leading this very nomadic lifestyle. And this is when he isn't receiving treatments as an inpatient in psychiatric hospitals. So he's also got 
quite serious issues with his mental health. Now, I do think to some degree, even though when I'm talking about Newman, obviously that causes a level of suspicion about his behaviour and actions, we do, I believe, to some degree have to take the confessions with a pinch of salt. So there is actually a phenomena where people do take responsibility for crimes that they haven't committed. And, you know, if they're not telling the police, they're going around boasting to others that this is the case, even though it's not grounded in evidence or fact. What I will say, though, is when it comes down to Newman, he did actually know Josh. And I guess on a personal level, when you think about being 18, meeting up at an abandoned cabin in the woods certainly wouldn't seem like an unreasonable place for teenagers to meet up and hang out. And I suppose if Newman had wanted to bring some harm to Josh, it wouldn't have been difficult to actually get him alone. And then he would have had him at his mercy, you know, especially if he had a weapon or an accomplice, for example. But in spite of these potential theories, to date, the official decision on Josh's death is that it was an accident. And as far as I can read into it, there isn't any clarity as to why Newman's potential link to the case hasn't been fully investigated. I mean, it could be that the police just know something that we don't, but there are a lot of people out there, and I mean many, including me, including me, that are not convinced that he died accidentally. And I personally feel that they should reopen the investigation and lots of other people, clearly those very closely associated with this, like his family, they want the investigation reopened. Because I don't feel that there is any form of closure that's been offered to the family. At the end of the day, what we're seeing is that this young man died in very mysterious circumstances. The way that he was found just elevates and amplifies the level of suspicion I have over it not being an accidental death. And even the guy who owned the property said there is no way this guy got in that chimney climbing down it. And that leaves me with the thought that Josh was likely killed and then shoved into that chimney. Then the breakfast bar was pushed in front of it and those individuals left the scene and it took all those years for him to be found, getting away essentially to some degree with the perfect crime. I think it's diabolical that the family have still received absolutely no closure. And I think that most of you listening, if not all of you listening will agree that there is something very, very disconcerting and suspicious about the loss of this young man. I would really like to know your thoughts. What do you think? Are you on team suspicion? Or do you think the coroner got it right? Can you think of a reason as to why Josh's clothes would all be neatly folded and then he would have gone and climbed down the chimney head first? Or are you more persuaded by the inclination of the hypothermia theory that his cognitive impairment occurred due to the blood flow to the brain being a problematic and he did die alone, freezing to death, so to speak? Or are you falling more down on the side of believing that he was murdered? And if so, why wasn't there too many traumatic injuries to the body? Please let me know your thoughts because this one has not been something I could get out of my mind since beginning researching. I cannot believe the family haven't found out what occurred. I can't believe that Joshua Maddox's death has been essentially ruled as an accident and I don't know what it's gonna take for this case to be reopened and a potential murder inquiry to be started. Certainly for me, I think that the fact that the coroner themselves said that they were flummoxed by how Josh ended up down the chimney and the clothes ended up neatly folded and so on and so forth is enough to cause me questions and concerns that this wasn't fully investigated appropriately or accurately. Let me know in the comments. I would really, really appreciate your points of view. And as ever, we have to remember that Joshua Maddox died in this case and that he deserves legacy and he certainly deserves justice. And right now, I genuinely don't think he's been afforded that. Take care, guys. See you again next time. Wednesday, Sundays, every single week. And I'd love to know your feelings about this case. Leave it in the comments for me. Take care. Be safe.